Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome, everyone, to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson, and today is March 20th, 2018. Now, human population has exploded over the past 300 years. In 1600, it's estimated that around 550 million humans walked the face of the planet. It was clearly a different world back then, with resources seemingly in unlimited supplies. But even then, in some places, people were packed tightly enough that local resources were unable to fully support everyone, and many dreamed of riches elsewhere. One popular narrative has it that a plucky band of pilgrims from England fled to America where they set up shop. As the joke goes, they were seeking greater religious restrictions for themselves than could be imposed under the king's law. Everyone in the American school system, including myself, learned the tale. Three ships, led by the Mayflower, came over and started the colonization project. Well, I often say that in order to know where you are, you have to know where you came from. Here to rewrite this engaging part of history with us is John Butman, who, along with Simon Target, co-authored the recently released book, New World, Inc. John is an American writer with several books under his own name and more than 30 collaborations, including New York Times and Boston Globe bestsellers. Welcome to the program, John. Thank you, Chris. Thanks very much for having me. Well, John, I have it on very good authority from Mrs. Johnson, who taught me in the second grade. (laughs) <laughs> that it was indeed the Pilgrims who were the earliest founders of white settlement in America. Does that need revising? Well, it, it does need revising. I should first say that there was only one ship that came over. It was just the Mayflower. Uh, ships came later, but in that first uh, first one in that came in November uh, 1620, it was just that one. But apart from that, yeah, um, what our what we say in our book is that really the, the whole development of America, um, you know, European America, obviously there was a civilization here before the Europeans got here, uh, the Indians, uh, but starting about 1550, uh, as you said earlier in your, in your setup, um, resources in England were scarce and they were in um, economic, social, and political crisis and seeking some solutions to to that crisis. And so they started looking for new markets uh, beyond continental Europe. And they, they first set their sights on, on China, and they said, let's uh, see if we can sell our main product, which was woolen cloth, in China. Um, but their, their routes to get there were limited, because the Spanish were dominant in Europe, and they had essentially divided the world between uh, between Spain and uh, Portugal, so that the English really couldn't sail south. So they decided they would try to sail north and go through uh, a passage that they called the Northeast Passage to China, which is essentially sailing across the upper margin of, of Russia to get to China. So to make a long story short, uh, that didn't work out. They couldn't get through the passage. They ended up in Russia, where they actually did open a market. But that was the beginning of this 70-year process, um, an unending chain of commercial ventures that eventually kind of inexorably headed them towards America and settlement. Now, at this time, so you say resources are are short. I'd love to get a a more complete description of really how crowded it was, but they had one export, wool and cloth. That was that was really what they were, their product that they had in abundance that they were looking to hopefully trade? That was their main export, was, was wool and cloth. They, they'd started with raw wool, so un, unwoven wool, and they then had developed um, wool and cloth, and that was, yeah, that was the major export. Uh, and they mostly exported it to continental Europe, but in 1550, for a number of reasons, the, um, the bottom fell out of the market and they weren't selling enough. And they were in the, the merchants, the leading business people of the day were uh, very gravely concerned about the economics of the country. Um, population was on the rise at that point, And 
the um, there was a strong divide between the the gentry and the common people, and um, as the um, economics got worse, the social situation got got very tricky, and there was really severe social unrest. So there was a real sense of we need to um, find new sources of revenue and new sources of um, of jobs. And so that's that's what sent them um, overseas. All right. So first they bumped around trying to go north, couldn't go south. Spain and Portugal have that all locked up. When when is the first sort of foray to attempt to go uh, to the west? When does that start? Well, so in 1576, they said, um, so this is 25 years after the, um, 23 years after the voyage that ended up in Moscow, they said, let's try again to um, go west, uh, because they'd actually gone west earlier in 1497 and, and gotten as far as the islands around Newfoundland. Hmm. Uh, so they, they felt they had some rights to this, this part of the world. So uh, a guy named Martin Frobisher, who, whose name you may have heard, he was kind of an adventurer mariner, um, backed by a number of um, courti- courtiers and merchants, put together a voyage to go west and look for the Northwest Passage. And again, they were trying to get to China, and they didn't get that far. They got to the islands, again, north of Newfoundland, and um, they thought they'd found the uh, entry to the Northwest Passage, but there was almost a mutiny. The men did not want to keep going. It was a very difficult situation, but they picked up a rock on the island and brought it back home. And somebody threw it into the fire. It started to glisten, and they thought, oh, my God, we found gold. Hmm. So in the context, uh, at the time, the Spanish um, were bringing back fortune in gold and silver from Mexico and South America and um, the English were very jealous of this, and they were looking for some, you know, sort of jackpot uh, source of revenue. So this black rock came back. They thought, oh, my God, we found gold. They began this process of trying to assay the rock, which th- that process was not very well understood at the time. And, but immediately, with the idea that maybe there was gold, they put together a second voyage, and they sailed off and brought back tons of rock, and even before they knew what the results were of the second voyage, they sent off a third voyage and brought, brought back even tons more rock. In the end, it all proved to be fool's gold. There was no money there. And it was incredibly embarrassing and deeply disappointing. They lost all their money. Um, and so they really, at that point, gave up on the idea of um, trying to find metals. But they began to say, there's 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 got to be something there. And the major resource in America, which they began to understand, was land. There's just a huge quantity of land. Now, was it actually fool's gold? It was, yeah. It was some kind of uh, friable, you know, uh, breakable rock uh-huh. that had a little bit, little bit of glisten in it. Um, but we don't really know. There's actually a piece of, of the rock still existing. I forget where it is, but it's in a museum in... Um, in England, so you can take a look at it. But it, it was this, you know, this extraordinary um, episode where the entire country was caught up in this gold fever. Queen Elizabeth the first invested in it, and they really thought this is going to be this is going to make our fortune. And it was terribly embarrassing. The Spanish were watching the whole thing and kind of laughing at them. <laughs> so, all right, how does so you said. Uh, they lost all their money. How did that work at that point in time? I mean, it, it's not cheap, of course, to build a, a ship. And then, of course, you've got to outfit it and you've got to get a crew. How did that actually work? What was the process? You mean, how did you raise the money? Yeah. What was the... Yeah. How'd that work? Well, so the, that's, that's where um, this, this first voyage in 1553 was put together by one of the first joint stock companies in the world and certainly the first in, in England. And um, it was basically a subscription that you're selling shares. So for 25 pounds, you could buy a share of this venture. And they raised uh, 6,000 pounds for this first uh, voyage in 16, uh, sorry, 1553. Uh, and they, they built three ships from scratch. 
they hired um, all the men and off they went. So it was a company that was basically formed to um, you know, share the risk because this is incredibly risky. They didn't know really where they were headed, what the route was going to be, what the results would be. So no, no single person, including the queen, could afford to, to fund such a venture. So that's, that became the model for almost all these ventures uh, in this period, 1550 to 1620. Uh, you had a number of investors. You, you often had a lead investor, you know, some kind, who, was, who would be a courtier or a leading merchant who would put in uh, sort of a seed money or the, or the major chunk, but you always had uh, a large number of investors who, who shared the risk. All right, now, John, where do the pilgrims come into this story? I'm not hearing anything about pilgrims yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Then gradually they began to realize that um, after 1600, uh, there were many ventures to, to America. And they thought at first, what we can do is uh, send ships over, leaving early in the spring, you know, usually March or April, get over to America. It would take six to eight weeks to get here. Uh, they would then go after a certain commodity, which would be fish or fur is usually traded with the Indians. Um, sassafras, which was a very prized um, herb that was thought to cure almost everything. And then we'll fill up the hold of our ships. We'll get back. We'll sell the material. Uh, we'll sell the, sell the goods in England and, and on the continent, and we'll make a profit. But they discovered that it was just not sustainable. It was just too risky to, to sail over. You couldn't bring enough back. You couldn't be sure that you would get what you needed. And so they said, we, we really have to establish uh, settlements. We have to get put people on the ground who can be operating the business and be preparing the goods so the ships will just come up and come and get them and be uh, distributors. So this idea of settlement, you know, came in. And that was the idea behind the uh, Roanoke settlement, which is 1584. And that's Walter Raleigh. He's, he's saying, we have to go settle. That didn't work out, but after 1600, the idea of settlement became um, sort of the dominant idea. So the pilgrims fit into this, this settlement idea. 1607, um, Jamestown is founded and is, um, you know, through a lot of struggles and a lot of difficulties and a lot of conflict with, uh, with Indians, continued and found its, its great, its great um, product, which was tobacco. So around 1617, there started to be a sort of um, colonial rush. And we had the French in Canada and Western Maine. And you had the Dutch who were preparing to come into the New York area. Then you had this, the Spanish farther south. And suddenly there was this kind of land rush for America. And the idea that the only way to, to claim land was to settle there and have people there who could um, you know, build a, a lasting uh, establishment. So that's how the pilgrims got into this whole thing. And what's odd about them is they're very, very different from any other settlement. There was, there was no uh, royal backing. There was no well-known uh, courtier. There was no leading merchant involved. But there was such interest in developing America at that point that they managed to hook up with a, um, or I should say they managed to <laughs> create a company with a kind of second tier um, entrepreneur. His name is Thomas Weston. He put together a group of 70 investors to put in money to fund the pilgrims. And the idea was that they were going to do what everybody else had done, all these other ventures had done. They'd come over, they would uh, trade for fur, they would collect sassafras, they'd collect timber perhaps, they would fish and they would be self-sustaining and they'd be profitable. They didn't really have a business plan. <laughs> they didn't really know how they were gonna make this money. Uh, and really the pilgrims, uh, the, the people who came over who weren't called pilgr pilgrims at the time had very little business experience. They were, um, they'd worked in cloth and they'd worked in, um, in farming. But they, they were not, you know, they were not entrepreneurs. So, um, but the, these investors thought we want to get in on, on this deal, and so they raised. It's really we don't really know how much money it was raised. It was at least at least fifteen hundred pounds, maybe as much as um, seven thousand pounds, which is unlikely. But so there are lots of estimates. 
So they were funded. They were a funded venture, and they were thought that they were supposed to be a profit-making venture, which took them a long time to make a profit. Well, this sounds uh, like the modern-day version of this would be uh, people out in Silicon Valley who are trying to make the next killer app. I mean, this is risk. It's putting capital up. It's 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 being taken by this idea, not really being totally clear if the idea is actually going to work out. When the dust settles, yeah. there were a few good ideas in there, but boy, there were a bunch of mistakes made by a bunch of people too, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have to sort of look at this whole process as one big startup of, yep. of America, because uh, there was tremendous trial and error, and there was so much failure you know, all, along the way. It was just constant failure. And usually what happened is the merchants who were putting money into these ventures had a, a, a diversified portfolio. So uh, American development was the really high-risk part of it. And so they would have other ventures and other investments in fishing. In They continued to sell cloth on the continent, and that business went up and down. But So they rarely put all their money into American um, development. It was, just, it was just too risky. But, you know, over 70 years, it worked. And um, they learned a lot. They learned about how to, how to organize a settlement, how to, keep it, how to make it sustainable, how you had to um, uh, resupply it. And they also got better at figuring out sort of the cost per person. So if you did a one-off um, trading venture, there was a sort of cost per mariner. And they worked out the cost per settler was way higher than cost per mariner. So they st- they started to sort of figure out what the costs were, what the risks were. It's interesting. You know, a while back, I, I interviewed uh, Darren Asimoglu, the author of Why Nations Fail. And there he, he was looking at... Um, uh, the institutional uh, inputs that, that create, you know, why one place is uh, considered a, a successful nation versus another. He had a really uh, interesting take on this subject of the early colonization of America. I'd like to get your reflection on that to help us and my listeners continue. We want to build our understanding of why we why are we the way we are. And first yeah. he outlined that all the action was in the South, where the Spaniards uh, and the Portuguese, they had this model, enormous success raiding and plundering these dense societies in Latin and South America. And, and then, uh, but that model really did not replicate well up North for a variety of reasons uh, in, in large measure because the native populations were structured differently, uh, less inclined to roll over. Um, here's what he said about the Virginia company. Look, these guys are doing what the Spaniards did, and they're going to make money just like the Spaniard, like the Spanish crown did. So we want to have a piece of it. And and then the Virginia company, you know, gets these uh, these funds, sends three ships to you know uh, to the north of the United States. It turns out, you know, the thing that they had uh, targeted was Jamestown, which is like an island of Virginia. Like seemed like a good place to start, but. You know, things didn't work out that way because they couldn't find anybody to do the work for them. So so their model was just go and overpower whoever we're going to find, just like the Spaniards overpowered the Aztecs or the Incas, put them to work, take their gold and silver, but more importantly, as you said, make them work for your benefit. Well, there's nobody there or there is only these, uh, you know, hunter-gatherers, very sparsely settled mobile uh, Indians, and they're not going to do your bidding for you. And so, so there, there is an impasse. They come up with the idea of bringing people from Europe. You know, there are lots of poor people in Europe at the time. You know, this is before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, population is increasing and not that much more productivity. So, so they collect people. It's a costly voyage for them. They bring them there. They're going to be the people, the, the the sort of the lower strata of society you know, doing the production for the benefits of the governors and the soldiers and the elite of the of the Jamestown colony and the owners of the Virginia company. But these people, as soon as they come in, they say, no, no, we're not going to be repressed like this. They start running to the Indians or they start just going uh, off by themselves. And that's when Virginia company realizes, look, we're just not going to be able to replicate what the Spaniards did because the conditions in the north are different than the south, just the population density and the complex civilizations we could take over are not there. And so that's when they throw in the towel and they introduce things like the uh, private property rights and the general assemblies that I hinted at before. John, I'd love to get your take on that. Darren makes it sound like uh, there was a model that the Spaniards had proven in some ways, uh, like many startups, you say, hey, let's fashion this after what's already worked. But that model obviously didn't work. Well, that is very interesting because um, for a number of reasons. First of all, 
I don't. There's no evidence that I I know of that says the English merchants uh, intended to subjugate the local populations. Mm-hmm. I don't think they really said we want to be like the Spanish, um, and for for a number of reasons. But there was one. I mean, one one is that they they had a very different sort of moral view of uh, these populations. They they ne- although the Jamestown people had skirmishes with the Indians, um, there was there was never any sense of that I know of that we're going to put them to work for us. That is just that was just not part of. Um, of the business plan for them. In fact, in, in the early days uh, in, in Roanoke, they um, they brought over a number of, of workers, as you say, from lower strata of society, but also a number of uh, aristocrats came, and they, they found the aristocrats were not very good at settlement because they were not <laughs> used to doing hard labor and regular work. Uh-huh. They expected everybody to uh, be servants to them, but they didn't, they didn't try to... Um, you know, they didn't try to employ the Indians or subjugate the Indians. Yes, they fought with them, but um, as far as as far as I know, that was not their model. So that's that's kind of surprising to me. Um, certainly, in uh, with the Pilgrims, they they really um, worked hard to try to uh, establish good relationships with the Indians, uh, and. One of the reasons for that was that they they were well established uh, trade routes and trade relationships throughout the Northeast, and they wanted to tap into those relationships. So they wanted to trade with them, but not make them work, not make the Indians work for them. And yeah, you know, the famous story is, of course, that um, the Pilgrims had a very tough first winter and lost about half half their population. And then um, out of the woods comes. Uh, this Indian named Tisquantum, known as Squanto, who had actually been in Europe for about five years and could speak English and had lost a lot of his people to um, to disease in in New England. So he's the one who sort of helped them um, understand how to grow crops and served as a, a go-between interlocutor ambassador between the Indians and, and the pilgrims. So I think the I don't think that they ever had in their mind. I think the English in general did not have in their mind. We want to replicate what the Spanish have done. Uh, in fact, they they reviled the Spanish and they did not um, support or believe in this kind of mass murder that the, the Spanish engaged in. Well, that that yeah, that's fascinating because um, uh, the the story of the Spaniards and Columbus and all that is is really dark. Um, and and so there was at that time a a moral aversion to that you think yeah absolutely i think the english thought of themselves as better morally better that they they would not engage in that kind of behavior now they did uh they they kidnapped indians they brought them back to england but they they treated them uh, you know relatively well of course it was kidnapping so you know within within the context of kidnapping uh <laughs> they treated the indians quite well and in fact um Squanto was, it's a, it's a long story, but, but Squanto was captured by a kind of rogue captain who had come with John Smith to go whale hunting in New England. That didn't work out because they couldn't figure out how to catch whales. Uh, so John Smith went off and, and mapped New England. But this, this captain, Thomas Hunt, kidnapped 27 Indians and took them to Spain to sell as slaves. And one of those Indians was Squanto. There was such a strong sense in Spain that uh, of shame that Spain had engaged in such uh, horrible acts of subjugation throughout the West Indies and uh, South America and Mexico that there was a strong uh, pushback to this slave market. So uh, a group of friars came and rescued some of these Indians, including Squanto. And he ended up staying in Europe for several years and... Um, learning English, and then being brought back to America by, a, by an English um, venturer. So there was also this history of kind of, of even if they captured some Indians, they often brought them back and returned them to America. So they had, they had this very different sense of what the relationship ought to be. Well, it's fascinating. Um, so this really, then, your, your book is, is telling a tale of, of mercantilism. This is, uh, you know, we, we've got a, a continent, it's full, 
looking for outlets at this point in time. Obviously, the Industrial Revolution hasn't started. Heck, coal hasn't even really you know come into uh, widespread introduction at this time. And they they really need, um, need – their model was had such low productivity. I guess you needed places for people to go. The rest of the world was kind of already, surprisingly, uh, full at that point in time, at least in terms of who owned the seas and where you could go. I mean, from our standards, it would be practically barren. But back then, it, it must have seemed yeah. that, that West was the only place to go. And so they came as a business venture. Yeah, they. what happened was the um, in 1604, a treaty of peace was signed between England and Spain. And this suddenly opened up America. Because before that, the English had been very worried about sort of treading on Spanish toes. Mm-hmm. And there were enough incidents of of uh, getting tricky with with the Spanish that they didn't want to do that. But after the, the peace was, was um, declared and this peace treaty was signed, they felt freer to go to America and claim territory there. So um, that changed. But also what happened was because conflict with Spain uh, was now effectively over, a huge number of soldiers, English soldiers, came back from the continent to England and they had, not, they had nothing to do. They had no work. And so the leading merchants were very concerned about what would happen when the population was suddenly flooded with all these soldiers looking for work. And they were concerned it was going to lead to, you know, to increased crime, to, to crowding, to unemployment, all that sort of thing, and more unrest as they had seen in the 1550s. And so that was another reason for settling in America was to give um, another another place, another opportunity for these people. But you know, the Pilgrims were they were in um, they were in Holland at this time. They were in, in Leiden, and their major issue was they couldn't make a living there. So if you read William Bradford, who was their governor, the second governor, and wrote the the classic work of Plymouth Plantation, he lists the reasons that they came to that they wanted to come to America, and they actually considered other places to go. They were they were given an offer by the Dutch to come to New York. They could have resettled elsewhere in Europe, but they decided to come here. And the, the number one reason was they weren't making it economically. They weren't. They felt their jobs weren't secure, and they could never really rise above their, their current station, which was okay, but not not really promising. And so that was that was the number one reason. What's odd is they didn't really know how they were going to do that. They just had sort of faith that they could do it. Now that's interesting, John. So today, the world is pretty much full to the brim. Every every dark corner is explored. Even the deepest wilderness today is stressed by human impact. So your 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 book and what you're saying here exposes the possibility that at least some of us are kind of born adventurers. Uh, what do these people do now with those instincts? Well, you know, so we 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 do make this parallel between um, these merchant adventurers of the 16th. Uh, century and early 17th century to our modern day entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And and you can really argue that uh, Elon Musk is very similar to these guys. And because England in the 1550s really felt it was, it was an existential crisis that England was in danger of disappearing, being swallowed up, being conquered, uh, losing its vitality, you know, losing its, its its presence as a, as a, um, as a society. And Musk is saying he, he really feels like the earth has so many problems socially, economically, politically, that we need to find a new place. We have, we have to become what he calls interplanetary. So, you know, the, the entrepreneurs in the 1550s were pushing off to the completely unknown, almost completely unknown territory. Musk is doing almost the same thing. It's incredibly high risk incredibly uh, filled with unknowns. It's going to take a lot of trial and error. So there's, there's a lot of similarity there, trying to find a whole, a whole new world, you know? Well, now, how much does, does this uh, entrepreneurial... So here's what I know as an entrepreneur. Um, yeah. You got to fail early, fail often. You have to surround yourself with the best people because you can't know everything. You're going to make mistakes, but you got to learn from them. Um, yeah. and, and that you want to get through your mistakes as quickly as possible rather than try and avoid them because you're going to make them. So... Uh, yeah. How much of, of, of that sort of trial and error became the infusion that that led to uh, America being such a, a, a dynamic sort of risk-taking enterprise throughout most of its history? 
Yeah, I mean, I really think that they, the English learned that through this process. This is not something they knew before. Because all the models they had before, before, the, before they started to go overseas with these ventures, you know, they were basically military models. So they understood how to go wage battle. Uh, they were political models and they were religious models, but they really had no model of this kind of risk-taking entrepreneurship. So they had to figure it out. And, you know, they had to understand that it was okay to fail. In fact, you had to fail. And if you didn't try something that caused you to fail, you probably weren't pushing hard enough. So just that very idea that failure is part of the process, they had to, they had to accept that. So that really had not been part of the of the business world before then, um, you know, they, they'd always try to fix things. So if the market fell out, if the market got bad in the continent, on the continent, they would um, try to fix it through various things like trade relationships, uh, manipulating the currency, et cetera. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't that kind of failure, but th these are ventures that are really high profile. Everybody's watching high risk, um, life and death. I mean, a lot of people lost their lives and a lot of people lost their livelihoods in these things. And they came to understand that was part of the deal. So that's, that's sort of one big learning. And I think that's completely infused into who we are today. You know, you talk to Europeans now, in general, they say America uh, accepts failure. They even prize failure. So I think that's, that's certainly part of our character and it, it, I think it really comes from this period. Now, along the way, there must have been, uh, you uncovered as well, there must have been enough successes to keep this all going. Uh, what, what, were some of the, what were some of the success stories in here? You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, there, there were a couple of success stories that weren't exactly about settlement. But one of the, um, one of the obvious ones is that um, Francis Drake went off on his circumnavigation of the world and he came back with <laughs> having, first of all, circumnavigated, which is a major accomplishment. <clears throat> but he also saw the west coast of America, and he said, "Here's a huge, uh, huge chunk of land we could we could go for." But he also came back with his hold filled with uh, gold and treasure, and they basically had been plundered from Spanish ships and other ships. But it gave the, gave the English this tremendous sense of, "Oh, we can, you know, we can do this. We can go off, and there is a jackpot out there." Now, it was never replicated. No one ever did that again <clears throat> to, that, to, to that degree. But it gave them a sense of, we can succeed. Uh, there, is, there, is a, there is this possibility of making a lot of money getting rich quick. So um, that's, that's part of it. And then I think there was just this, you know, you have to really accept um, a big uh, element of imagination and hope and sort of belief and um, promotional will, if you if you will. So there were, there was a small number of people who had this idea that America could could be something fantastic, a new society, a whole new world, and that really started with um, Thomas More, who wrote the book Utopia, and that first came out in 1516, I believe, and was republished around 1550, and started people thinking about there could be a whole new place across the sea, where we can kind of remake society, have a whole new uh, social order and great prosperity and some kind of equality. So this idea really got uh, in, in inflamed people and said, this is something we can do. And this is this fantastic hope. So for all the failure, there was always still this real sense of um, we can achieve something really extraordinary. Plus, there was just good old... Um, desire for glory. There were a lot of guys who just wanted to go out there and achieve something amazing and become famous, which, which they did. So there was enough of that that kept people going. So, that, you know, there was just enough return in terms of money, in terms of glory, and then driven by this big um, sense of imagination and hope that kept them all going. Oh, John, very well said. In fact, as I listened to you, I was thinking of Elon Musk because he said something very similar, which is, 
hey, if we go to Mars, we get to reinvent all sorts of things. It'll be governed differently. A lot of a lot of that hope yeah. which says we can we can restart and reboot this and and here's we'll take what we know, but we'll make it better. Which also to flip it around, um, for the rest of us who don't get to go to Mars, um, there's this other idea which is boy, once you get full up and your institutions become entrenched, if not sclerotic, it just seems easier to go somewhere else than to reform <laughs> all of that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's totally true. What's really interesting is that the three guys who were the most sort of powerful advocates for American development never came to America. Hmm. So it was all in their minds. Right? <laughs> and they were, they were great uh, promoters and um, motivators. So the first one is Thomas More, who didn't really think of America, but he thought of overseas somewhere, you know, mm-hmm. somewhere to the West. And then there was uh, Walter Raleigh, who he was really the first one to say, let's go settle over there and organize Roanoke. But he never came, um, largely because Queen Elizabeth I didn't want him to leave. She liked him too much. Mm-hmm. And then the third guy was this guy, Richard Hacklett, who became sort of the great chronicler of English overseas venturing. And he wrote, it's, he, he wrote um, this enormous book called Principal Navigations, which was in effect a huge... Uh, motivational, promotional tract about England's great exploits overseas. And he was the number one promoter of American development. He called it planting. And he never came. He had two chances to come, but he said, I I don't think I can go right now. (laughs) So it was these three guys who imagined America, but never came, who uh, were, you know, in large part responsible for England's desire to come over here. Well, it's you know fascinating to to uh, think about that that important element of having meaning and purpose and hope, and uh, a sense of of a place to go. And yeah. as I uh, tour through you know some of the things that our um, people are struggling with today, it, it's they're lacking all three of those things. They don't have a clear sense of direction, meaning and purpose yeah. are often not found in the jobs that they have. So in many cases, you know as uh, I, I, I see the parallels here, which is that, you know, London in the 1500s had a sort of a bleakness to it for a certain segment of the population where they're like, I'd rather be doing something else. I'll take a risk. Uh, that may not be yeah. all that dissimilar from somebody stuck in a minimum wage job today, only yep. uh, it's, it's, uh, there, there's nobody coming along except for maybe Elon saying, let's, let's go somewhere else. Let's do this. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think that's true. I mean, of course, I don't want to, paint too rosy a picture because things were kind of bleak and was very tough over here. And a lot of people came over and said, oh, I'm not staying here. Like, get me back on the, on the first ship, ship out of here. Um, Cause it was tough. And th- that is why um, once they got here, and this was true of the pilgrims and also true in, in Jamestown, that they, the organizers and the leaders of these settlements discovered we have to give people a share in the benefits, a share of the profits, they have to be able to own their own land, they have to be able to improve themselves, they have to have representation, they have to have a voice in this whole process, uh, we have to think about the total social good. So uh, once they got here, they realized that it couldn't just be about profit, it couldn't just be about uh, these organizers uh, running the show, that it had to have a, a strong social purpose. And people had to be able to uh, gain for themselves. So this is, you know, sort of the beginning of the American dream. Fascinating. So John, final question, How, what, what, uh, what drew you to write this book? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. I, you know, my family, um, we, we are among the, I think it's like 30 million Americans who are, who are related <laughs> to Mayflower people. So it's like no great distinction, you know, yeah. um, because a lot of us, go back to the Mayflower. So in my family, there's always been sort of a sense of history and always known, you know, I always surprised when people say who, they don't know who their relatives are because my, my family is constantly talking about their relatives and going back to early days. So um, I've always been intrigued by, by that history of, of how we got here. And then um, I was doing some work uh, on some other topic and I, I just kept bumping into names uh, of people involved with the pilgrims early on that I'd never heard of before. And one of them was this fellow named Sir Ferdinando Gorgias, incredible name. Mm -hmm. And it turns out he was, um, he was one of these guys who was organizing 
ventures. And this this led me to look into this whole issue further. I discovered, you know, the Pilgrims were a very different organization than I had learned and that I, I, I thought they were. So that led me to explore further. Good old curiosity. Absolutely, exactly. John. Well, listen, yep. best of luck with New World Inc. Uh, we all hope it's a raging success for you. It's on Amazon right now, I understand. How, yep. how else can people uh, follow you in your work? Uh, well, you know, uh, my co-author is Simon Target, mm-hmm. who, is a, who is a Brit, so we're kind of a Anglo-American collaboration, which is, is kind of cool because we both we have very different views of this. Um, we're, we're on Twitter, we're on, um, we're on LinkedIn, so we're not hard to find. Well, very good. John, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Chris. It was, it was really, uh, really interesting. Great questions. Thank you.